Hello and welcome to the Godcast. Uh, I am Xavier, and today we'll be going over a tier list of extinct religions. Uh, there are obviously many religions that have come and gone. Um, in fact, the atheist thinker Sam Harris once said that the mass grave of religions, well, that's called mythology. I do sort of beg to differ, though. There are religions that are very similar to, say, Christianity that I would not classify as mythology that have, that have since gone into the mass grave of religions, so to speak. Uh, so today we'll be discussing a, a variety of distinct, extinct religions. All right, so let's start today in D tier. Our first religion that we are looking at is actually a, ch a very specific church. This is the Universalist Church. This existed in the 19th century and up until uh, the 60s in the 20th century, it existed as a church that preached a universalist doctrine in terms of salvation. So the love of God was so great that everyone would eventually be saved. Uh, naturally, we get, as well, we get the American Unitarian Association, which preached a doctrine that God is one being the Father. God is one in person and one in being. What happened? Well... This also existed up until the 1960s, but in the 1960s, these two churches merged together to form the Unitarian Universalist Association. So that completes D tier. Let's take a look at C tier now. We have Pythagoreanism. Pythagoreanism is, well, it's the religion and, and or philosophical tradition of Pythagoras, who lived in the 4th century BCE. He was a philosopher. He was uh, a mathematician, and he ran a school of called Pythagoreanism that was, in some ways, both a religion and a school. He came up with his own numerology, which becomes interesting later in like the study of Gnosticism. For example, one that number the number one is monad. Well, interestingly enough, in Gnosticism, which we'll get into in a second, okay, a series of seconds, a few minutes, is actually becomes God in Gnosticism, in later Gnosticism. Why does Monad become God in later Sethian Gnosticism specifically? I should make sure to try to differentiate between the various strands of Gnosticism. Well, it's because Neoplatonism, which was a Hellenistic, highly religious school of philosophy, it, uh, given that Plato's Academy existed for like 800 years after his death. Well, eventually, around the turn of the Common Era, there was a group of people who were the Neoplatonists, and they had that Pythagorean numerological term called monad, and monad became one, the individual unit, and that individual unit became the one in Neoplatonism, and Neoplatonism influenced Gnosticism. But to really just hammer the point home of Pythagoreanism, why it's so interesting as well, Pythagoras ran his school almost like its own religion people were super in exercising people had to um people actually celebrated the sunrise supposedly and there's a painting of that which is very interesting and people um he also pythagoras was also interested in music theory as well but from a mathematical standpoint and they um in order to be initiated into this group you had to take a um, you had to have this whole initiation process that you went through in which it was like years of sort of asceticism. Um, and he also believed in reincarnation, as did Plotinus, who is the luminary of Neoplatonism. Let's go to Atenism next. So Pharaoh Akhenaten, in the early, early, early days, the early annals of human civilization, had this bold idea. What was that bold idea? The bold idea is that we have all these gods who exist in the e Egyptian pantheon. What's actually going to happen is we're now going to reduce these gods down to one, essentially. Okay, what does this sound like? This sounds like the earliest form of monotheism, and it very well, very well may have been. It could have also been henotheism, but even if it was henotheism, the belief that there's one God, while not denying the existence of others, that's still super, super, super revolutionary. This concept was of this this whole religious um, system was founded around the belief that Aten, who was the sun disk, who was the sun, corresponded with the sun, was this one being, or at least the highest of all 
of the gods of all the god beings. So we have that, which is a very, which is very interesting. It certainly earns its spot there as possibly the earliest form of monotheism. Let's go to B tier now. In B tier, we have Mithraism. Mithraism is a very fascinating religion because it has so many similarities with Christianity. You're going to have, for example, the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is mentioned in, obviously, the, the Bible or the Christian Bible. Uh, it's mentioned, obviously, in the New Testament. What's, what's, su in, what's super interesting about it is it's also mentioned in not only the Gospels, but the earliest sources about Christianity, which come from the Apostle Paul, which are his seven authentic Pauline epistles. Interestingly enough about the Lord's Supper is that phrase verbatim comes not only in, from Christianity, but also from Mithraism and from the Bacchus cult. Uh, Mithraists would practice things like baptism, and clearly this image here depicts, and there's another, um, there's other pictures of it as well, it depicts Mithras going through some sort of str struggle in which he slays the bull. That's like the archetypal passion narrative that we're going to find in a lot of, that we find in a lot of, rather in all, of these mystery religions. Uh, similar to Christianity, Christianity has Hellenistic um, Hellenism woven into it, uh, Mithraism, it, well, Christianity is Hellenism plus Judaism. What is Mithraism? It's Hellenism plus Persian culture. He's wearing Persian garb, and he's slaying a bull. So, uh, so, um, and there's Persian symbolism as well in the religion. So there, it, it's really, if you want a really interesting synopsis of how Christianity and other mystery religions parallel one another, Dr. Richard Carrier is an amazing source to go to. I highly recommend watching his lectures on this. They are mind-blowing stuff, and they're not just some, he's not just some fringe scholar who says a bunch of things um, out of um, conspiracy theory ideas. No, he actually is a very accredited historian, so we have that. But the point about myth, but the point about Mithraism is that Mithras but the, point about, but the point about Mithraism is that this is a syncretic, Hellenistic mystery religion that had also that had the Lord's Supper and it had baptism and it had a passion narrative of some sort. Let's go to Basilides. Basilides won't spend a whole lot of time on Basilides, but he's an interesting figure. He was a Christian. It says Basilides Hereticus. Basilidas Hereticus. He was a very uh, mystical teacher of Christianity. He claimed to get his authority from a disciple who was a, or from, he claimed to get his authority, he claimed to have been a, some sources rather say that he was a disciple of a person who was a disciple of the Apostle Paul, okay? Or rather, the Apostle Peter. So it's very interesting that there's all, all these arguments about apostolic succession, both from a historical standpoint and from a religious standpoint, well, Basilides, or at least people claim that Basilides claimed to have this same sort of apostolic succession. Uh, what's interesting about Basilides' teachings is they're incredibly esoteric. They're, um, this, he was in Egypt, and he had, sev he had severely um, Hellenistic and severely mystical interpretations of Christianity. It's a very fascinating um, belief system. Um, I'm not going to spend any more time on it, but I highly recommend, you know, checking out yourself. Very fascinating stuff. Now let's go straight into A tier here. Um, we have Hermeticism. Hermeticism is a very fascinating belief system. This is Hermes Trismegistus. It was really revived during the Renaissance. So this here is Hermes Trismegistus. This whole belief system is really um, revived during the Renaissance, and people are looking back to the sources. Essentially, what this was believed to be was, by some, it was a nexus between um, Egypt and Hellenism and Judaism. Interestingly enough, some people even thought that Hermes Trismegistus could have been the teacher of Moses. You might be thinking, what is this all about? Well, what Hermeticism was, was it was both a philosophical tradition. It was both a, and it was also a magical tradition as well. There were, there were spells, there were alchemical um, things, there were the idea of the transmigration of the soul. It was um, very, it was very Hel Hellenistically inspired. It arose in Egypt. It was also had um, uh, some interesting, it, it was, it was woven into the Egyptian 
concept of gods because Hermes Trismegistus was uh, sort of to some degree already existent in the Egyptian pantheon, but um, he was also equated with Hermes. Um, so it, it's like a, it's like a combination of, of Egyptian gods of an Egyptian god and of a, a Greek god put together, uh, so to speak. And this um, he, he was believed to have taught humanity magic and then ascended into the ether. So and then so he left behind all sorts of texts like the Emerald Tablet uh, and, and the larger um, corpus Hermetic, Hermeticum. And these um, talked about, like I said before, religion, philosophy, and magic. All right, let's go to the next one in the AT here. This is a very fascinating extinct religion. These are the Cathars. What the Cathars believed was that what you had was you had the God of the Old Testament who was, in their view, evil, okay? And this God of the Old Testament, what actually happened was the God of the Old Testament created the universe, okay, as it says in the Old Testament. But the catch is that the God of the Old Testament, as well as being evil, um, was possibly even equated with Satan, but he was. But there was also the God of the New Testament who was this good God who sent Jesus. And human beings were actually angels who were trapped inside of human bodies, and they viewed the human body as evil and the material world as evil. And they were, it existed in, around the, well, in the 11th century and other uh, eras as well in France. And they were, as in this picture, horrifically persecuted by the Catholic Church at the time. Um, the Cathars had a Docetic Christology in which Jesus appeared on earth essentially as a hologram and was a purely divine being. Some sources believed, some sources claim that their belief may have been that once the number of fallen angels um, reached the number of angels in heaven, what actually what happened was that was when the world was going to end. There was also a belief that uh, Satan fell from heaven because God, who was called the Invisible King, had two wives, and Satan wanted to have one of those wives. So what happened was um, a battle ensued, and then Satan was flung out into the ether and then created the universe. Um, so it's a very fascinating, very elaborate theology. Let's go um, actually partway between A tier and S tier. The man, the myth, the legend, Valentinus. Although this is probably not an actual picture of him, but we're still going to pretend that it is. Valentinus had a very stripped-down version of Sethianism, I would argue, which we'll try to get into uh, in a few minutes. But what Valentinus believed was that well, he was at one point the most popular theologian in the Christian world, although he was denounced as a heretic. His view was that, as a common trend with all these religions, or most of these religions are, is the influence, I think you could actually argue, every single one of them with the exception of Atenism was that there was this tremendous influence of Hellenism. I mean, even Christianity itself, if we're going to stri strip out the Old Testament uh, or the Hebrew Scriptures, um, Christianity itself, the, the New Testament specifically was very Hellenistically influenced, so that doesn't, the Cathars are not exempt from that Hellenistic influence. But the point I'm trying to make about Valentinus is that he got really Hellenistic. He said, okay, the Old Testament, throw that out. We're actually going to do is we're actually going to really look at the accounts of Jesus and the Gospels through a super esoteric standpoint. What we're actually going to do is we're going to believe that Jesus was part of many different was was one of many spirits who were called the ions, and they're going to, we're going to also going to use different texts. We're going to use several texts that don't exist anymore, as well as the Gospel of Philip, which is a very esoteric writing, which is attributed to the Apostle Philip. And it's a series of Valentinian sayings, and it talks about one particular, well, it's all interesting. It talks about one of many interesting topics, which is the bridal chamber, which is the, which is the, this is the, a sacrament in Valentinianism in which you are linked with your guardian angel. You're linked back to, back to the pleroma, which is the highest degree of heaven, um, which is actually the only true heaven. There are seven false heavens guarded by the archons, who are these evil beings who try to imprison humanity in the material world. The Demiurge is this being who was the creator of the material world and fell from the pleroma because there was this one Ion, which is one of these divine spirits. Her name was Sophia, and she accidentally created this Demiurge creature because she wanted to uh, produce things without uh, a male pair because the Ions were, are, are paired enough male and female order. So if... if so she tried to 
produce something herself and then she accidentally produced the demiurge emirs created the material world and only some people have this thing called the spark and what actually allows you to do is you is through learning about valentinianism which was a movement within emerging catholicism at the time it wasn't some separate um sect it was a movement uh, in which Val well, valentinians would go to like churches and so forth um but they just also have their own meanings and what you do is you go to those meetings and you learn the secrets of the universe to eventually escape the universe. Let's go right into Manichaeism. Manichaeism or Manichaeism is a very fascinating religion. It's not entirely extinct. There are several people who still practice it in China. Um, and there are people who practice it online on Reddit. And there are people who, there's also a website uh, that people who claim to be Manich Manichaeans. Um, just to be re relatively brief, the Manich Manichaeism was a quote-unquote heresy of Christianity um, founded by a man named Mani, who he, uh, he was a prophet in what was then the Sasanian Empire. He got a lot of sponsorship by Shapur I, who's actually one of my favorite emperors of all time in human history because he was a really cool dude who said that religious tolerance is actually dope as heck, and he also defeated three Roman emperors and was the only um, dude to capture a Roman emperor. He captured a Roman emperor alive, who then died in captivity. He also basically trampled a Roman emperor, although that might be a bit exaggerated, but he was defeating the Romans like it was nobody's, nobody's business, so a cool dude. Back to Mani, right? He was a Persian prophet, and his prof, prof, uh, prophetic ideas was, okay, we're actually going to kind of move away from ritualism because he was part of this Baptist, likely Jewish Christian, possibly the Elkasites Baptist sect who was who performed weekly baptisms similar to the Mandaeans, um, which are a Baptist sect that exist uh, um, in between Iran and Iraq. And what, what the, um, the Mani sect would do is they'd baptize people like every day and in he he or rather every week and he uh, when he was about 12 this being this heavenly twin appeared to him okay and what this heavenly twin told him was he told sort of told him like the secrets of the universe and Monty eventually matured and started his own movement after like a, he disputed with a baptist sect um there's actually a story in which a palm tree is being cut by one of his fellow brethren in that sect and the palm tree cries out in pain to Monty. Um, and uh, or in general, perhaps one of the two. And what Mani does is he starts his own religion, and it's it's very it's incredibly pacifist. We're not gonna, you know, the the there's two brand there's two parts of the religion. There's the there's the hearers or the, the lay people and the elect who are similar to, you know, Buddhist monks, um, and and the elect could could not eat meat. And they couldn't even pick vegetables. The, that's what the hears out. The hears have to pick vegetables and fruit for them. Um, and they would give the elders would give them, a, or rather, the um, the um, the elect would give the uh, hears a blessing in return. Okay, so what did Monin's religion preach? There are there were f uh, four at least quote unquote major prophets: Mani, Zarathustra. Jesus, Monty loved Jesus, huge, huge, huge fan of Jesus. Uh, in fact, the Man Manichaeans would probably have referred to themselves as Christians. They would, have, they would have probably referred to themselves as Christians. And there's the fourth prophet, or quote-unquote major prophet, the Buddha. Okay? And so it was a universal religion. It taught a very a similar Gnostic doctrine, but it was also dualistic, so it wasn't really Gnostic. I would argue it's more like dualistic, in which the universe was created by a good god and a bad god, essentially, um, fighting each other. So, and every, 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 not every human, but everything had a spark. And uh, through right practice, your spark can descend out of, ascend out of the universe and be with God. Uh, let's, let's go with the last one right here, Sathianism. So, Sathianism is a... Um, is similar to Valentinianism, except um, there's a lot more literature, there's a lot more quote-unquote mythology. You're going to have things like the Gospel of Judas, which tells a secret story about Judas. You're going to have things like the Apocryphon of John, which, surprise, surprise, is John telling you secret information. Um, so it's very, very fascinating with all this stuff here. Um, so I go on really quickly if you're Sethianism, but if you want any resources, the uh, gnosis.org is an excellent place to look because they have the entire Nag Hammadi library right at your disposal. So that has been a tier list of extinct religions. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I am Xavier. This has been the Godcast. And uh, like and subscribe for more videos. See ya.